apparently got to put this in my ear first of all. Right, today we've got two people from the Troughton era. Our first guest is... When I... Our first guest has done most things on Who, from being an actor, um, through writing what I consider to be probably the scariest Doctor Who script ever, to writing um, what I also consider to be one of the very best Doctor Who novelizations ever. Um, he's also been a script editor on the show. He's written for shows as diverse as Time Slip and Fraggle Rock. Um, please welcome Victor Pemberton. I'm sure this is going to fall out of my ear sometime. All right, Victor. Um, you last actually wrote for the show in, um, dare I remind you, about 1967, was it? I was, I was a child. You were a child, yes. You were a child prodigy, writing Fury from the Deep. That's right. Um, 20 years later, you were commissioned to write the novelization of Fury from the Deep. How did you feel about it, novelizing something you hadn't presumably thought about for 20 odd years? <sighs> Devastated. You asked me, you should, you, uh, you should know. Well, it was an extraordinary experience because A, I hadn't written a book before and B, uh, I'd f forgotten a great deal of Fury from the Deep and um, uh, it was very difficult because uh, there were no scripts available, there were no videos available, uh, so everything I had to do was literally, literally from memory. I asked the BBC if they could let me have some, some scripts and they said, well, they got some camera scripts. And um, I, I'm sure you, you're all aware of what a camera script looks like. Um, there's no detail in there at all. It's all kind of technical things. So I had to actually write the thing uh, from memory, describing the sets and God knows what. Mm -hmm. so, but it was a staggering experience. Yes. Yes. I know. Yes. <laughs> How long did it take to write it? I've forgotten. Mm, a long time? It was a long time, yes. Yeah. I think it was... Um, when I sat down to actually do it, I think it took about five or six weeks mm. to actually get it down. Yeah. Mm. Which do you prefer writing, um, the script as it was shown, or the novel? To be honest with you, both. I, mm. there's, I have no preference. I enjoyed writing the, the novel very much indeed, because it was breaking new ground for me. Mm -hmm. And I like prose. Um, but I like writing scripts as well, you know. Mm. Were, you, were you quite staggered at the interest shown in Fury from the Deep, and certainly the interest shown in yourself? After you'd written the novel. <laughs> well, yes. I mean, one is always very flattered indeed. You know, it's, it's, it's nice. It was a, an interesting story for the time. It was very expensive, as you know, when they yeah. first did it for those days. Um, so it's, it's nice because most of you can't have seen it. I mean, it was... Uh, how long ago was it? 20-odd 20, 20 years? 20 odd, well, yeah. one or two of you might have seen it. But um, uh, it was quite an undertaking for the time in which it was, it was made. But uh, I'm glad that people liked it. Yeah, I was saying many, many people did like it, and many fans do regard it as a classic of that era. Mm -hmm. um, can you think of any reasons why it should be regarded as such a classic? I don't know. I think um, the setting. You see, when it was when I first did it, um, it was the time that North Sea gas was being developed, and I just thought it was so kind of creepy, uh, uh, or as Dame Edna says, spooky, um, that. Uh, it was worth, uh, you know, I always, my science fiction, I always like uh, to be very much earth-based and I wanted to relate it to something that was happening to us and North Sea gas was suddenly being pushed into our ovens and I thought, well, there must be a story there somewhere and I do try very hard, I, I may not always achieve it, but I like to have a good story if I can mm -hmm. um, and then there were two characters in it too. There's a uh, Mr. Oak and Mr. Oak and Mr. Quill, That's yes. right, yeah who were based on uh, Laurel and Hardy, because I knew Laurel and Hardy, and uh, I wanted to do a kind of tribute to them, so that's how they, they developed. And I know that the fans at the time loved those two mm -hmm. very much indeed. Mm -hmm. So how, um, w w did the BBC approach you to write the script, or did you mm. contact them? No, they, did, uh, they asked me to do it. Uh, as you know, I was script editor for a while there, mm. and in those days we weren't allowed to be a, a script editor and write for the show at the same time. So I was, thank you, was it Jin? No. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, so they, they <coughs> after I'd finished my spell uh, working with them as a script editor, mm -hmm. I went off and they said, why don't you do something? So I did. Mm -hmm. I came about. Um, did you ever consider writing another script for Who? 
Yes, I did, but mm -hmm. um, I actually, uh, after that, went on to do uh, a uh, time slip. Mm -hmm. So I was involved with science fiction for a, a fair amount of time after that. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, not to my people, I can't think of it, Ace of Wands, if any of you have seen that. Mm -hmm. do, you, w do you prefer writing science fiction? or are I, you Not all the time, no. I like it to come up occasionally. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are so many clever science fiction writers around, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's highly competitive. And I have great admiration for people who write science fiction these days. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about your script editing experience on Who. Um, <coughs> which scripts did you actually edit? Um, th the one I'm given full credit for is Tomb of the Cybermen, yeah. mm -hmm. which was uh, directed by Morris Barry and uh, was uh, written, uh, written by, I think, Jerry Davis and Kit Pedler. Yes, right? that's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, th that was a very exciting thing to be on because they were breaking new ground as well. and. I think I've said this before, but to be actually be in the studio while it was being done was also an experience, because Lime Grove Studios, as you know, is, is kind of pocket-sized, and they had created a, an amazing atmosphere in the studio um, with the actual tombs themselves, and it was very creepy to actually, I think Debbie will tell you, that it was very creepy to, to actually be there. Mm -hmm. well, we'll talk to Debbie in a minute about Two yeah. of the Cybermen. Mm. Um, now, apart from script editing and writing for Doctor Who, both as a novelizer and a script writer, yeah. you've also acted in Doctor Who. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. This always comes up, up yeah. <laughs> um, can you tell us which one you acted in and how you got the part? Moonbase. Mm -hmm. Moonbase, yes. Yeah. Which I was a Cybermen story, yeah. That's right. I played a character called Jules who was taken over very quickly mm -hmm. so that I could get out of it. Um, yes, it was Morris Barry who asked me to do it and because uh, I'd been around a bit at the time. Um, it, was, it was great fun. I mean, mm. I've told this anecdote so many times now, but I mean, uh, there was another guy and myself, we were, we were kind of astronauts going out on the moon, and we had these kind of fish bowls stuck on our head. And um, as we wandered out onto this very elaborate set that they'd created for those days, what they didn't tell us is that the damned fish bowl steamed up and we couldn't see where we were going, and so we went straight into the set, knocked the whole thing down, and we're hysterical. But that was the sort of thing that went on in those days. And of course, you worked with Pat Troughton on that, and we'll talk mm. about your experience with Pat Troughton later when Debbie's mm. here. Um, finally, you, you're now a producer mm. on Fraggle Rock, of all things. I don't uh, no giggles. <laughs> <laughs> now, how did this come about, and uh, what was well, your job involved on with the Fraggles? I've been involved with the Fraggles uh, from... Uh, uh, it's uh, conception, really. The, the, the executive producer is a friend of mine, and also I know Jim Henson, who, as you all know, is a, is a brilliant uh, uh, and talented man. Um, I, ca it, I was asked by uh, uh, the executive producer at Henson's to, to write it, first of all. And Fraggle Rock is a very technical, very expensive, very talented show, in as much as it, most of it is shot in the United States. And we, the stuff we do over here is um, set in a lighthouse. And all the, the little fairy creatures meet up with, with the real characters eventually. But it's a very technical show indeed, and it takes all one's effort and time to put it together. And we've now done, I think, something like 72 shows. Um, first of all, we had Fulton Mackay playing the... Um, uh, the Lighthouse Keeper, and in the last season we had John Gordon Sinclair from Gregory's Girl, I'm sure you all know him. Uh, and we're about to do the very last of the series. And apparently you've had a very successful rating, haven't you? Yes, we've had the best ratings uh, that the children's television has had for that type of programme ever. Mm -hmm. so. Right, so Victor, you've produced, you've script edited, you've acted, you've novelised. What are you going to do next? Is there anything left for you to do next? Dance? <laughs> Dance? <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I mean, I'm very happy with what I'm doing, and I, mm -hmm. I treat every day as something new. Yeah. And uh, anything interesting that comes along, uh, and, and uh, also, as long as I'm able to pay the bills, mm -hmm. that's, that's quite enough. Would you ever consider writing for Doctor Who again? Um, I don't, I'm not really sure about that, no. I think uh, that would be going back. I'm actually in the process of setting up a science fiction series at the moment, mm -hmm. um, which I, I can't talk too much about it because it's in a delicate stage of negotiation, but it will be a long-running, we hope, uh, uh, serial. Yeah. But uh, the Doctor, although I have great admiration for it, as you know, I, I'm, uh, I don't care for it 
in its present form, but uh, I think it's wrong to go back on something after quite so long. Mm -hmm. So it's very unlikely we'll be seeing Victor Pemberton credited on Doctor Who in the near future. I would doubt that very much. <laughs> okay, for the moment, Victor, thanks very much Thank indeed. Um, our next guest is um, a regular guest at these things, very popular with everyone here. In her time on the show, she's had to cope with Daleks, Cybermen, Ice Warriors, Yeti, and some horrible seaweed creature. Um, she's also got the biggest and the best scream in the business. Please welcome Victoria Waterfield, Debbie Watling. Hello, everybody. Hello. Morning. Right. Okay. <clears throat> I've just been, to Debbie, I've just been talking to Victor about how he felt after um, a 20 year absence from Doctor Who. Um, from writing a script to novelizing something. Your last appearance on the show was actually uh, 1960 oh. something or other, wasn't oh, it? Oh, I don't remember that um, long ago. It can't be. <laughs> yes, it was, actually. Yeah. How do you feel about coming to events like this to talk about a character who, is tw who you haven't played for 20 years? Well, my first convention was two years ago. It was actually here. And uh, I was rather nervous about it because I thought, well, I did play Victoria nearly 20 years ago. Um, I can remember a lot about her, but I'm sure I'm going to be shot questions which I can't answer. So I was pretty nervous, as I say. But uh, I don't know how to explain it, really. It came back to me. She came back totally to me, the recall, mm -hmm. when people started to ask me questions. And I love it. I mean, I find it extraordinary because, don't get me wrong, but when I did Doctor Who, it was like a... Uh, another job, you know, I'd just done another TV series, and I didn't know it was going to go on for that long. And being dragged back and back and back and saying, ah, oh, Victoria Waterfield, here she is. I thought she'd been forgotten about by now, but she doesn't seem to be, and I'm rather flattered. There, that well, answered your question. Were you very much aware that there was a great fan following of both Doctor Who and the character you played? Or did that come as a total surprise to you? Well, it did come as a bit of a surprise, I must admit. Because, as I say, I mean, 20 years, and people can forget. I mean, some people I see come up to me and say, oh, Miss Watling, um, Victoria Waterfield is one of, you know, our favourite companions, and it might be this wonderful, tall, handsome man. And then he'll pause and look at me and say, of course, oh, when you did it, when you did your episodes, I wasn't born. <laughs> I think, oh, thank you very much, you know. So it brings it back to you a bit. <laughs> Oh, you don't look a day older than oh, Victoria you. was 20 years ago. <laughs> so, so, Debbie, how did... <laughs> <laughs> so how did you get the part in the first place, Debbie? Um, at that time, the producer was Innes Lloyd, and uh, he rang my agent and said, look, I've just seen Debbie do Alice on telly, and we think she'd make a wonderful companion. And so my agent rang me and said, go up and see Innes, like, tomorrow, for the part in Doctor Who. Well, I did. And um, we chatted about it, but we both decided that I wasn't really experienced enough at that point. So we mutually agreed that I would go away uh, for a couple of months, maybe six, and uh, learn a bit more of my trade, then come back, which I did. And uh, so I played Victoria Waterfield about a year after I was really offered it. Was it a sort of dream come true? Had you grown up with Doctor Who at all? No. I hate to say that... You never watched it? <laughs> I... Uh, I saw the first episode, uh, but then you see, when you're in the theatre on TV, you don't watch much television. Because, mm. you know, you're quite busy, hopefully. Aren't, aren't we, Victor? <coughs> you're very quiet. Yes. I'm not this. This is your <laughs> moment. <laughs> okay, Debbie, you got, um, I believe you had a nickname uh, on the show of Leather Lungs. Um, would you care to explain how that nickname came about? Do I have to? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's because. Uh, in my day, the girl in The Companion screamed a lot. She didn't do a lot else. She screamed, though. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <I've> got... <laughs> and uh, so I had this, I suppose, this amazing scream. I mean, 
I, I sort of could break glass. and I mean, it was ridiculous. It was huge. And then I, so I got the mm. name Leather Lungs. Yeah, it, that's it. Yes. Would you like to demonstrate that scream? Oh, right? dear, oh, dear. Would any, who would like <gasps> Debbie to demonstrate the scream now? But it... It's not pretty, I would. <laughs> it, it... All right. Thank you. Well done. Did you, um... Did you say ten quid? Oh, great. Is this an auction, then? <laughs> yes, can we auction off Debbie's can we scream? Can my scream? It's only for her scream. <laughs> oh, <laughs> all right, then. <clears throat> do, do, do we need some I warn you, it's not. particular monster to come up behind you? Have we got any monsters to come up behind Debbie and oh, frighten yeah. her? <laughs> uh, I'll remember them. What? Gary Russell. <laughs> Would Gary Russell right. like to come up here? <laughs> Excuse me, just having some water. I hope it works. I don't know. Gin, that gin. Let me know if you're going to do it, will you? Are you ready? Shall we count you down? I feel a fool! <laughs> <laughs> you idiot! Shall, shall we count Debbie down? Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've got to get myself together first. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> At last. <laughs> this is meant to be my friend. <laughs> right. Mm. Okay, I'll count you down. Now, okay. are we all ready? Right. We're all ready, right, I okay. I hope something comes out. I mean, uh, I, anyway, we'll see. Right, from a count of five, okay? <clears throat> five. <laughs> Hang on. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> wait. Ah, okay. Right. Five. Four. Three, two, one. Ah! <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you. That was a scream. That was a scream. You used to do far better than that, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful, beautiful. You can demonstrate a scream if you want as well, Victor. <laughs> Victor, Victor, what's your party piece then? What are you going to give us? What am I going to give? I've got you there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're going to scream as well? No, 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 no. no. <clears throat> we'll think of something else for Victor to do later. No, no, you're right. Oh, yes, we will. Um, getting back to um, Victoria. Um, as I said, you were very much a screamer. Do you think your character suffered because of that? D did you have opportunity to develop the character at all? Oh, yes, I think I developed her. Um, I... <laughs> don't take this personally, Victor, but I did, I think, the best with what I could do. Uh, you know, mm. what the girl had to... Well, it was written it like, like in these this. days. <laughs> no, 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 no. But, uh, I mean, you must admit that one of my, my favourite story was the last one, Victor, which oh. was yours. Seaweed monster, fury from the deep. But uh, no, I think I did develop. I didn't want it to be, uh, I don't know, wimpish, you know, sort of girly girly. Um, mm. I wanted a bit of guts about her. That's why I think I wore these most extraordinary costumes. I mean, what were that? T I had hobnail boots on at one point <laughs> with, um, what do you call those trousers that end at the knee? Uh, what? Uh, Not joppers, no. Uh, plus fours or plus something. Four, yeah. Plus fours. And a little tweed jacket, and I looked quite butch, really. Sort of tomboyish, that's how I wanted her to be. I had to get that, uh, that Victorian frock off me pretty quick to make her tomboyish, I tell you. Yes. So you, you weren't very much into the Victorian frocks? Oh, I thought it was lovely. It was very romantic, and we filmed this wonderful old house, the first episode. Um, it was of uh, Gilbert and Sullivan's old house in Harrow, and that was wonderful. Can they hear me now? That's better. Can you hear me at the back? You can. But, uh, and that was one, and I loved it. It was all, as I say, romantic. Uh, but then the, the skirts got shorter and shorter. The second episode, I thought, well, the second storyline, was a Cyberman. And I thought, I can't be in this Victorian frock the whole time. I mean, I looked like a Dalek. You couldn't see my feet. <laughs> so, <laughs> so on the Cyberman, I thought, right, I'll have a little shirt dress. And that was just below the knee. And this was on the day, in the days of the miniskirts. And uh, so they actually got shorter and shorter and shorter throughout the year. So at the end, I was rather like I was in a pelmet at one point. Mm. Mm, afraid so. Did, did you uh, find when you left the series, you were typecast for a while as a Doctor Who girl? Yes, 
Absolutely. Um, I was out of work for about nine months. I put some money by well, that I'd earned in Doctor Who and I thought, great, this is my time. I can have a sort of a second string to my bow. I'll, I'll open a shop, a boutique, and uh, I can rely on that, you know, fine. It was a total disaster. I'm, I lost everything, so I thought, well, this is no good. And then I was off for the series, The Newcomers, which is a very long time ago again. And uh, so I got back into it. But it was a pretty hairy nine months. Although people still sort of said, hello, Victoria, and all that. And you thought, oh, I shall only be known for Victoria. But uh, no, I, I think I've done quite well. Do people still come up to you in the street and say, hello, Victoria? No, not as such. No, they, they say, hello, Debbie, we remember you as Victoria, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. Or you were Victoria Waterfield, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mentioned before that um, during your stint on the show, you met all the big Doctor Who monsters from Daleks through to Ice Warriors through to Yeti, to, through to the seaweed creature, yeah. through to Cybermen, obviously. Mm. Um, did you find any particular, particularly difficult working with monsters, with men in funny suits? Plenty <laughs> <laughs> of monsters in those days. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really, because, I mean, yes, of course, you look at these things, you think, you get the giggles, don't you? Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got to. Um, because I'm normal, you know, and thing in a plastic suit comes up to me and you think, oh dear. Um, anyway, no, we, we got the giggles out of our system during rehearsals. And, but when we were on the floor actually taking it, the actual episode, mm -hmm. it was for real because if you're not convinced that they are terrifying, you're never going to convince your audience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I'm right, aren't I, Vic? Can yeah. we bring him in now? Yeah. He's very silent. <laughs> <laughs> Victor's just mentioned uh, Tomb of the Cybermen, which you were in. Yep. Um, that did come under a lot of criticism at the time for being incredibly violent, showing Cybermen being gutted and dropping dead all over the place. Were you aware at the time, or at any other time, that Doctor Who could be scary for kids watching it behind the sofa? No, the only moment that I was aware that it could be scary uh, is then we had a special effect... Uh, Oh, you have to help me now, Vic. Um, it was uh, uh, the Yeti story, one of the Yeti stories, and there was the head monk, uh, played by Wolf Morris. He had to die, and uh, you had a shot, a close-up of him on the floor, and you saw his whole face disintegrate down to the skull. And they never used that shot because they thought it would be too terrifying. Mm -hmm. And it, it was terrifying, I must admit. Were, were you aware of the criticism at the time levelled at Tomb of the Cybermen? No, I wasn't at all. This is totally new to me. Mm -hmm. No. Okay, um, well, Patrick Troughton did say that he tried to make his part quite a comic part to take the scary bits out for the small children watching. Um, you both work with Patrick. He's now sadly gone. Do you have any fond memories of him and how he used to try and take the scary bits out? <coughs> I think Pat was a very inventive actor. Oh. Um, he had a great imagination, and <laughs> apart from the, the thing of working with actors, and I, I'm sure you must have found it, I mean, working with, with actors and actresses, he was a very generous actor. He never tried to upstage anybody, <laughs> uh, to, my, to my knowledge anyway. And um, the fondness is really just being with him. He was, to me, oh. a source of constant joy. He was always telling the most lovely stories about people and things. I, I mean, I met him a long time ago before Doctor Who, and he was just a lovely man to be with. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I've said up here, in fact, uh, before, um, it's hard to imagine a world without Pat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Apparently he, used, he also used to play an awful lot of practical jokes on <laughs> yourself, Debbie. Me? Yes. yes. Well, yes, it was Patrick and Fraser, really. They plotted against me. For a whole year. Quite right. Did you never no, try? It wasn't. Yeah. No. I never, never got them back. You see, they always found out. <laughs> um, no, I never got them back. You never tried to take your revenge out. No, on I did them. try, but it uh, was foiled at the last moment. Mm -hmm. Did you yeah. did you res resent that at all, or was it all part of the oh, family no, spirit? Oh no, you couldn't resent it at all. It, we were like a family. Pat mm -hmm. phrase myself. I mean, it was uh, Pat became really to me a best friend and like a second dad. Mm -hmm. He really looked after me and we had a lot of fun together and Fraser was just like a brother. Mm -hmm. He was smashing. Mm -hmm. Although he does give the impression he wasn't like a brother, I can tell you now he's like a brother. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're on a panel together this afternoon, so watch out. Well, we're gonna, we'll throw this open in a second, but um, I'd like to ask both 
Debbie and Victor, one question about the character of Victoria. Um, Debbie, you played her for seven stories. Victor, you wrote her out of the series. <coughs> um, first of all, Victor, um, it's been 20 years since Victoria left the doctor to stay with the family called the Harrises and settled down to a life of near normality. What do you think Victoria Waterfield would be doing now? Oh dear. <laughs> That's, That's a, a sneaky one. one. <laughs> That's a sneaky one. I have the faintest idea. I think that she um, would, would miss the doctor. I think she would like to think that one day she would see him again. Mm -hmm. That I really do think. And, and Jamie, because there was a very, I think, and this was partly um, Debbie's acting and phases. I think they developed the relationship so well between them. It was a kind of unspoken thing, but there was, it, it was a kind of brother and sister relationship in a way, but one felt that there was a great fondness between them. Uh. And particularly by the time it came to that very last show in which uh, Debbie uh, left the show, it was really very touching. Do you remember, Debbie? Well, I remember that on yeah. the last shot, we were actually recording it in the studio, and I had to say goodbye to the Doctor and Jamie. Mm. And I kid you not, they were real tears. Mm. It just happened. You know, water in the eyes, and you thought, mm. "Come on, pull yourself together." Mm. But it was—it was like that, mm. and it was like leaving a family. Mm. Is that a rare thing to happen on a TV cast that you do feel so close together? I think it's pretty unique, mm. actually. But then we have been working together for about a year. Mm. You know, and we got very close. And when you work uh, six days a week, um, you do get close. Mm. Would you like to return to the show? I don't Victoria know. Or something else. Oh, I could Even never come. Even as a monster? Come. No. <laughs> no, I'd have to come yes. back as Victoria. Yes. What? As a monster. No. <laughs> no, no. No, I'd have to come back as Victoria. Mm -hmm. I couldn't possibly come back as anybody else. Mm -hmm. And Debbie, where do you think Victoria would be now, 20 years on? I think she'd be a writer. I do. I think she'd be a writer. And, um... Yeah, yeah, no, no, but please, no, I didn't mean that. And, uh, you know, but she gets all her ideas uh, from her dreams when she's asleep. For children's books. Because she lives through what she's gone through when she was Doctor Who. She didn't, she just thinks it's a total dream. And she writes them all down, her experiences. Mm. Would you ever like to write the story of Victoria? Me? No. I leave that to the professionals over here. Ah. <laughs> Okay, let's throw it open to the floor now. Any questions for either Victor or Debbie, or for both of them together? <laughs> Anyone? No one at Nobody's all. Nobody's got a question. You rotten, I mean, you rotten. what a shame. Eric, Julie, save us. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, ah, there. there's one there. Oh, there's an audience there, I can see you there. Yeah. Uh, as someone who actually, oh, can we just get <coughs> down there? As someone who actually saw the uh, Tomb of the Cybermen, whereabout was actually filmed? Especially the scene with the one I always remember is where they actually opened the door. One of the um, space crewmen went to open the door and was electrocuted. There's two big doors at the beginning. That was Lime Grove. Yes, it, it actually in the studio. It was studio. in the studio. Yes, it was. Because it always looked so realistic, as if it was in yes. some one of the famous pits somewhere. You know, one of the uh, mm. quarries <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> We did actually uh, film in one of those famous quarries. Mm. Well, I'd forgotten what it's up. What, what was it? What were we doing? It was Simon, wasn't it? Was it Simon? It was Simon, yes. yes yeah. It was. It was Simon, especially when they opened the doors. You saw the bloke get. Uh, That's right, attributed. yes. No, that was actually in the studio. Was it? Yeah. Oh, it's it was pretty well done, wasn't it? Was it was very good, because you yeah, never realised. Very effective. That. They used uh, uh, dry ice in the actual uh, uh, tombs themselves as they opened the, the doors. You remember the, 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 the kind of coffin tomb things? Um, this kind of dry ass <laughs> came out, you know, and it was, it it was, was quite effective, fun. especially now, you can still um, remember the interiors, yeah. especially when you went to the lower levels, when you opened that large cylinder top, yes. like the sort of submarine sort of hatch, yeah. and that opened up and it went down. That's right, yes, and I remember when um, the Cybermen, I think, if I'm correct, if you'll correct me if I'm wrong, um, they're all in cases, glass, um, they're meant to be nice, aren't they, and we think they're dead. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. And yes. of course, they only frozen, and yeah, one starts to wake up. That's three right. Layers high. Like it, like a honeycomb, wasn't yes, it? Yes. Yes. That sort of thing with a Cyberman in each. Amazing set. Wasn't it? it was wonderful. But then the most I thought it was really scary when just one Cyberman slightly moved, and that was all. Mm. And I thought that was really scary 
Maybe it had something to do with it being in black and white. I don't know, yes, but it, it had was. tremendous atmosphere. I spent most of the time watching it from behind the couch. Did you? You, know, like you were one of those, yeah. were you? Yes. Ooh, I spent yes. most of my time back at that. Yeah, I think it, it was very much inspired by the Frankenstein thing, you yeah. know, bringing the, the monster to life again. I suppose it was pretty frightening for young kids, yeah. wasn't it? Mm -hmm. But it didn't have any seem to have any effect on anybody. Mm -hmm. The ones I've known who actually watched the series, they haven't gone out and repeated the actions. Yeah. As people say today, you know, they're watching the violent programmes. Yeah. We had the, yeah. didn't we have the cybernauts in, in them? All oh, those dreadful the things, things that used to... Cybermats, yeah. Cybermats. That's right. Mm -hmm. Pat and Fraser love those, I remember. They were awful, though, because the little men by the side of the set controlling these things. <laughs> And when I used to walk on the set, they'd shoot straight for my feet all the time. I'd jump over them all the time and then get off, get off. There was Fred in the corner giggling. <laughs> Using it, doing it. <laughs> okay, any, any more questions or just over there? Yeah. Just there. That's just there. It. Were there any problems with the foam in Fury from the Deep? The foam. With the foam. Yeah. Problems? The foam. The foam. Yes. <laughs> it used to break down all the time. It was created especially for that, you know. Um, what happened was that uh, I didn't write foam in originally. It was seaweed. But while I was actually writing it, the BBC Special Effects Department, Michael, what, you, come on, you know his name, Special Effects guy, Michael. Michael. Who, anyone want to help us out? Anybody know them? Michael John Harris. Michael John Harris. Okay. Uh, I was in charge of special effects, and he came up with this idea to make a kind of um, uh, draft foam, uh, which could be used uh, quite dramatically. So what they did was they pumped it out of um, out of these fast machines, but you know all machines are <laughs> temperamental, and uh, sometimes didn't work. We shot the thing in the middle of winter. Do you remember down at Margate? Don't remind me. <laughs> Margate. Yeah. Margate. Um, and it was February and there was snow around and various members of the cars actually had to wade it into the water. Um, I suppose they'd never make it in black and white now, but the old episodes of mine that I have seen, they had a tremendous amount of atmosphere. And that created the tension and I think it really worked, didn't it, Vic? Yes. I, I thought so. I think there's a place for both, actually. Mm. Um, there are certain stories, I think, that were quite supreme in, 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 in monochrome. Uh, and there are some stories that uh, do better in colour. Some of John Pertwee's uh, um, shows, I thought, were, were superb in colour. Um, it's, it's the same in the cinema. Um, I'm violently against colouring early monochrome films. Oh, yeah. I think oh. it is sacrilege. Uh, we have some of the great films of Orson Welles, like Citizen Kane or The Magnificent Amps, and all those early films. To colour them to me is sacrilege, because they were made, they, they were a conception by the director of a particular subject. And if he wanted to do it in colour, he would have done it in colour. And the atmosphere can be quite wonderful. The Third Man, for instance, you know. Mm. And some of those early ones with Pat, I think, are quite wonderful in, in monochrome. But that's not to say that you should never use colour. There are certain things that lend very well to colour. Right, any more? Chuck right at the back. Right there. <coughs> um, Deborah, oh. what, what's your plans now for the um, theatre and film? What are my plans now? Your future now, your future plans. My future plans are, I am going to appear in a play called Wife Begins at Forty. At the sw the theatre, stop it! No, <laughs> <laughs> the Grand Swansea, and I'm playing that for about a month there, playing opposite Trevor Bannister. Well, and I've played opposite Trevor many times, so that'll be fun. But I have been told, because I haven't read the play yet, and I, but it's the Lisa Goddard part in it, so it's the lead, which is nice. But I have been told the first scene. I I've been to a fancy dress ball with my husband, and he. We both walk in the front door and to relieve the babysitters or whatever, he takes his coat off and he's in the Superman outfit. And I take my coat off and I'm dressed as Wonder Woman. Well, I'm not quite sure about this. <laughs> but it should be an experience. I have no idea. It's, it should be quite fun. And I think we might be going on tour with it afterwards. Any, any uh, TV? Not at the moment, no. No, I wish I could say yes, but no, not at the moment. So, Richard, um, what do you think of the film? The up-and-coming Doctor Who film, or do you know of it yet? Last time. Pardon? 
the Doctor Who film. Oh, sorry, Victor, sorry. Victor, yes. <laughs> Sadly, become Richard. Oh, I beg your pardon. Could sorry. You just be that. Be else. Uh, the um, film. The, 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 they're making up a Doctor Who film. The film. The, the Doctor Who film. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, uh, I don't know. Has anybody been cast yet? I know. That. I don't think so. <coughs> Sorry. I don't think so. Oh. Uh, well, I don't know very much about it. All I know is that the, the Henson organisation have been approached to do with monsters. Uh, whether that's happening or not, I don't know. But um, I don't know. I have mixed feelings about it. You know, uh, the, the previous films I don't think were very successful, were they? <coughs> I think there's. I've got a feeling that Doctor Who is very much of the television screen. He was born on the television screen, and I think that's his place. I think once you start opening it out to that extent, <coughs> I think it loses, I don't know why I should say this, but I think it, it loses an impact somehow. It, it also loses a certain intimacy. So you don't um, give it... Sorry? So you don't give it much hope then? Sorry? You, you don't give it much hope? <sighs> I wish it well. Okay, any more questions? Over there. Yeah, have um, Debbie or Victor got any views about the way a lot of these old stories were wiped off the archives by the BBC? Oh, sacrilege. Um, a lot of them were yours, weren't they, Debbie? They were. Yeah. There's only four of mine left now. I think it was rather short sighted. I didn't know if it was an accident or they wiped them off on purpose. I, d I don't know. But uh, if they did write them up on purpose, I think it's short-sighted. It's part of the history's program, quite frankly. One should keep the footage, wouldn't you think? It's so typical of the BBC, I have to tell you. It's the sort of thing they do. Not only is it uh, short-sighted, um, they lose a lot of money. Now, if they had those programmes, just think of the sort of money they would be making from overseas sales now. I wonder if Michael Grade was at the BBC then when they did that. Sorry? I wonder if Michael Grade was oh, at the BBC then when they did that. They're trying to get us to say things about poor Michael Grade. <laughs> oh, it's not fair, is it? No. It could well have been, yes. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's just, it's, it's red tape gone wild. You, I have to tell you that what they do, they do it in radio and in television. They send a list around uh, to producers and they say, and this is a list of productions, and they say, which of these do you think you can get rid of? Or we can get rid of? <laughs> Most of the times, the producers don't see these damn things, but they, they send it round. And then they just, if, if they don't get a reply by the 14th of June or something, then they just, <whistles> they wipe them. Some of the great names in the world have disappeared from the archives. BBC archives on both sound and television purely because of these silly little people who... Did they wipe um, Hancock's half hour? No, no, some of them they did, didn't they? they? Some of, them, some of the um, early ones have been wiped, mm, yes. Yeah. But they do this all the time. It's, you see, the archives are not in the, in the control of people who care about that material, sadly. Mm. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yes. Um, in the Eve of Dalek, you actually see Charles and Corkin as they should have been, as you do know. What other ones can you think of? I can think of the Yeti uh, one, you see Yeti on this sort of uh, hillside, but you don't actually hear any news, you just see it sort of coming across slowly. Yes. Can you think of any others? I can't, I'm afraid, no. Um, they did use it in the, in the Yeti store. We should ask David, shouldn't we? Yes. David, are you still at the back there? David Spencer, who plays Tommy in uh, The Abominable Snowman, is here. Back so he should David, David, can sir? you... Yeah. David? I don't think it was... No, he's keeping it very quiet. Um, no, I can't honestly uh, say that I remember. Um, but he, he used that funny screwdriver thing quite a lot, which came, first of all, in, in Fury from the Deep. Is that screwdriver your idea, Victor? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Which you know, the screwdriver lasted for about 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> Quite extraordinary, but uh, it was a sonic screwdriver, I think, wasn't it? That's right, yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, in the particular season that Debbie was in, there was only like one four part story and the rest were six parts. Do you think that's an ideal um, length for a story? 
in Doctor Who, you know, to develop characters and things. Wh which was the four-parter, then? The Tomb of the Cybermen. Ah. No, I, th I think the six parties, actually. Uh, uh, really, it's obvious reasons, I suppose. Uh, the story can develop more. Because mm, we're now down to three parties as well in the current seasons, yeah. which is not really, you know, terrific. Things start off... No, it's a bit off. short, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you can't get that involved over episode three episodes. Two, and episode three, they, you know, they close it up and that's it. Oh, dear. A bit like comic strip. Yes. Mm. I don't agree with that. Victor, what do you think is the ideal length as a writer? Six episodes. I think six is a... Is, it, it gives you enough time to, to establish characters. It's terribly difficult to establish new characters. I don't mean the existing characters. I mean new characters. And uh, by the time you've got into it, I think six is a very... Well, for me, a very comfortable um, block to write. <coughs> young man there. OK, any, any more? Can I ask... Yes. Um, um, uh, what do you think the ideal length of a season is? Because then it was about three times as long as it is now. In terms of episodes. Yes, you, you were on for about 40 or well, did I, did, I think I did about 40, 42 yeah. weeks, is it? Yeah, something like that, yeah. 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 And what, what is it now? It's 12, 14, isn't it? Yeah. It used to go on forever. Mm -hmm. it, we well, it did, actually, yes. <coughs> yes, it did. But the point was that that time you were on 42 episodes a year, and it, the, the stories were brilliant, they were really good. And now we've got 14 episodes of, well, mediocre stuff. Oh dear, Victor, but speak, it's speak. It looks Go very on, nice. Victor. It looks He's very dying nice. to answer this. Go on. It looks very <laughs> nice. It's, it's, um, it's not the same. No, it doesn't sound the same to me at all. No. It's a different. It's a totally different ball game now, uh, from my point of view. It's just. It doesn't. Um, it's plastic. That's the only word I have for it. Uh, and I'm, sa I'm sad about it. I don't revel in it. I think it's very sad because I have great affection for the Doctor. Uh, which, uh, whoever plays the Doctor. I, obviously, we all have our favourite Doctor. Can I ask you, please, can I ask you, what is your ideal, or who? I don't necessarily mean in, 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 as an actor, to name an actor, but what is your ideal Doctor Who? What is the type of Doctor? It would be nice to have a few ideas from you. Yes, it would. Yeah. What is your ideal type of doctor and companions? Is any <laughs> there, quite right. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. <laughs> Even I have to agree, unfortunately. I have to, because you hit me. <laughs> but what about a doctor? I mean, suppose you were to roll them all into... Oh, here's another one. How about you? Me? I'm too expensive. <laughs> I mean... Anybody got any views on that? A bit of both, you mean? Yeah. Mm, you know, I think could you could put a combination of all of them, wouldn't it? And, yeah. I mean, who, who is the favourite doctor here? I mean... Really? Mackay? Mm. Should we put it to the vote? Yes. Yeah, right. His favourite is William Hartnell. Right, Pat Troughton. Oh, no. John Pertwee. Tom Baker. Peter Davison. <laughs> <laughs> Colin Baker. Oh, and Sylvester McCoy. It's Pat Troughton, isn't Pat's it? Pat's got it. Yeah. yeah, Pat's got it. Great. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. There you are, Pat. Well yeah. done. No, I think that's, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Right, have we got any more, any more questions before we do wind up? Um, no. Nope. Right yes, front here. Yeah. We've done. Why do... Why do... Uh, <laughs> thank you. Why do Victor and Debbie think that Doctor Who was such a... Was that classic era? What made... Why was it a classic era? I agree it was, but why... Well, I suppose I can really comment because... Uh, yes, I was in it, yes, and they say it's the era of the monsters, the year I was in it. I met some marvellous monsters for a start. The scripts, I thought, were pretty good. Not all the time for me, but I did enjoy them. I had to settle down. And, um, no, no, no. and it, it had a lot of atmosphere. It was in black and white. And I think we had a wonderful time together, personally, which came over on the screen. We had a marvelous relationship, Jamie, Doctor, and Victoria. And I think it came across. Yeah, and it was very natural. It was. It wasn't sort of, 
Well, I don't want to really comment very much, but I think today's is sort of plastic. It, the acting seems to be a bit put on. But it, in the, uh, the Trout, in the early episodes, it seems to be quite uh, mm. good. I think Most of the time. You know, to be fair to, to um, today's setup, um, don't forget that when we were doing it, it was the early days. It was. So yes. we were kind of breaking new ground, we were able to be original and uh, to a certain degree. Um, it's very difficult when a show has been running for as long as Doctor Who, was it 25 years now? Is it 25? Yeah. Must be, yes. Yeah, 25, 25 yeah. You know, to be original. But then, to counterbalance that, I have to say that. In those days, we did not have the great sophistication of special effects. No. I mean, everything was kind of handmade and done on the studio floor with <laughs> yeah. matchboxes and string and all that sort of thing. I mean, these days you have all the, the, the special uh, technical visual effects. So. I Do you mean, think there are too many special effects today? I think there's too much. Mm -hmm. But, you know, everybody has their own. Okay, right at the very back. Find the mic. Sorry. We've got the mic. Oh. Right at the back. Uh, what do your families think about um, all the involvement you still get from Dr. Uli? I Now it's my... What family. reaction do you get from your family? What, uh, reaction from my family? Yeah. Your family? They think it's wonderful. Your family? <laughs> <laughs> they think it's wonderful. They are, they're amazed, actually, that it's got, it's, has, it's got such a following and all these conventions are coming up, which I love attending and of course my dad wants to come to a uh, convention he was asked to this one because he was in uh, two storylines with me playing professor travers and uh, he'd love to come on the panel and join in with all the fun but he was as i say asked to this one but he's working so he couldn't he's but uh, please actor, ask him again because he's dying to get here smashing actor Jack he one. is he smashing really is. you should ask him nice man okay uh, right at the back there in the corner By the curtains. I'd like to ask about the uh, Pescaton story and why wasn't it televised? The Pescaton story. Oh, the Pescaton. Oh. <laughs> well, there was a lot of jealousy with BBC. It, it was not their idea. And anything that's not their idea, they're not interested in. <laughs> it was, uh, what happened was um, Argo Records came to me. Uh, the producer uh, at Argo Records and said, could I, could I do this, could I do something for Tom Baker? Uh, and they wanted to do a Doctor Who record. And so Tom and the producer and myself got together at Tom's uh, house and we talked through an idea and Tom said that he wanted a kind of King Kong type story with a monster. So uh, I came up with the Pescatons and we talked it through. And then it was put to the BBC um, a, su a suggestion that it should be um, uh, done as a, as a serial. And they wouldn't even reply to our letters, uh, our requests. They were so livid that, in fact, it wasn't a BBC record. But they never thought of putting it on, on a BBC record, or doing anything on BBC records at that time. So, in fact, the Argo people were the first to do it. But uh, they got very snooty about it, as is their wont. Okay, but over there, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'll pay you later. <laughs> no, yeah. Thank you very much. No, yeah. Maybe it's something to do with the programme, because, I mean, Fraser doesn't look a day older either. Something to do with the programme. Maybe it's eternal Doctor Who, I mean. Hormones. <laughs> Hormones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, over there? Yes. No, I haven't. No, no. She can't. Short, short answer, I can read, just you about. Can't read. Just about. Be quiet. Um, <laughs> no, I haven't. Very short answer, no. Right, any, any more questions? <laughs> People have often said to me that uh, I'm uh, obsessed with fishy stories. I suppose so, yes. I got uh, uh, pescatons from Pisces, you know, from the, 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 the fish sign. And yes, you see, even Fury from the Deep had its origins in a radio serial called The Slide, which I did originally. It's a heartbeat that got me, really. 
Sorry? It's a heart beating pesca tons. That reminds me of Phil. Really? Really, yeah. yeah. Well, I suppose so. I, I've always had this kink about heartbeats and everything. I'm hoping mine will stay around and keep beating for a bit longer. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I've always found it quite, quite spooky. And I was, I'm very influenced by early Hollywood films, you know. Um, but uh, uh, the slide was the first time that the heartbeat appeared in, in some nasty mud. That was a serial starring Morris Denham and David Spencer back then. So. Okay, has anyone got a question for both Victor and Debbie? Yes, there, over there. Yes, first of all, Debbie, if you had the chance to play the character of Victoria again in the series, what sort of story would you choose? And to Victor, if you had the chance to write her back in to yes. the series, what sort of story would you choose? Well, you see, I, I think we'd have to collaborate on this one, wouldn't we, Victor? Yes, just give us five can, six can, hours. Can, hours? Would you like... <laughs> <laughs> I really don't know. Um, uh, I've never been asked, asked this before. Uh, well done. Um, I'm flummoxed. Um, I, uh, what sort of story? Uh, well, she's a good character, to, uh, uh, for start. She, I don't think any of us have the chance to explore her as, as much as one would like to. You <laughs> <laughs> it's a sex star daughter. Sex maniac, should you? Aren't they awful? <laughs> <laughs> to continue. <laughs> we never had that chance. We would like to have explored the character of Victoria Wardfield. <laughs> sorry. Of the film. Yes. Um, sorry. No, no, go on, carry on. I'm fascinated. No, no. Um, <laughs> But as I said before, it's very difficult to know um, the sort of story that you can put uh, a character that's <laughs> been in it before. I, I mean, she went back to the present day. She didn't go back to the Victorian period, did she? No, no, she, she was present. So presumably one might take her back to the Victorian times, perhaps. But I just think that it would be nice for her. She'd have a longing to meet the Doctor and Jamie again. Hmm. Especially Jamie, because I think there was a very special relationship there, and I think that's a, something I, I, I personally would have liked to, to explore. But isn't, w when you leave Doctor and Jamie, all that, isn't the memory kind of wiped out? Isn't it hazy? So she doesn't quite realise if it was real or if it wasn't, all these adventures that mm, keep no. coming back? No, I, no? Think, I think that relationship was so strong. Mm, maybe. I think it was so special. Right, any more questions? Good question, though. Oh, it is. Mm. Any more for both Victor and Debbie? There's one there. Yes. Do you have any special plans for the program? Of the program? Yeah. Don't think we'd be invited. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Yeah, yeah. What a funny question. <laughs> Uh, no, no, not, not really. Victor? Well, I don't think, I don't <laughs> don't think, think us old, well, this no, old one and this young one are really, uh, <clears throat> I don't think we're, we're, we're likely to be invited to that sort of, to any, any official celebration, shall we say, at the BBC, because it doesn't often happen. I've never been invited to any official BBC function at all over 25 years or however long it's been. Never. Oh. Oh. Okay, finally, can I ask just, uh, one question each of Victor and Debbie. Victor, first of all, what do you think makes the ideal Doctor Who script? If you were given advice to a prospective Doctor Who script writer, what would you advise him to do? Stories again for me. A good story. Come up with a good, an idea first. Develop it into a good story. You can get a good story, story in a dozen lines, half a dozen lines. Once you've got that, then you can go on to develop it and then develop the characters. There is no substitute for a good story. And That's it. Debbie, what do you think makes the ideal Doctor Who girl companion? I think she's got to have a tremendous sense of humour. Yes. Really? Absolutely right. Okay, then. Thanks very much, Victor Pemberton and Debbie Watley. Thank you. Well done. Your table is wonderful. Brilliantly done, Mr. Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Brilliantly done. Right, is this working?